We are in the hand sh uh, handbook for discipleship. We've entered into uh, kind of a, a topical study of really discipleship issues that clarify some things that maybe believers are not as clear on. We are uh, finishing tonight uh, the, the uh, chapter that was chapter number two, I believe, in understanding your salvation. And it ends kind of a strange way. And that is it ends with the Spirit of God and our salvation ends with the Holy Spirit and His work in our salvation. Before we pray and we begin tonight and share some things, I think that it will be great, exciting things for you. The whole way through, I'm going to tell you that I'm going to need your involvement. It is, uh, after every point tonight, there is a place of feedback that I need you. But before we go on, I must not forget, some of you know that uh, Marianne Davidson broke her foot. That's just what the Davidsons needed, okay? And uh, basically, here's the deal. Uh, Mr. Davidson is cooking for her. I was over there this afternoon. He is cooking for her the best that he can. And um, she need, I asked, I said, our people want to help. We need some things that you uh, will let us do. Uh, Mont, I believe that you're the deacon, so if people could come to Mont, this is what we need. We need one person immediately who will go shopping from a list uh, for the Davidsons, grocery shopping, um, in the next day or two, okay? They need to go grocery shopping. It's going to be a huge ordeal for them to do that. So they'll, they'll pay for it. They just need someone to do the shopping, okay? So if you can do that, uh, see Mont Poe. Is there anyone already right now that says, I know I can do that? Okay, please see Mont Poe and come and fight that out, all right? Please, there's about six or seven of you. Uh, I would like to send in a couple of meals, not a lot, but some. Uh, Mont, we, I don't want to, Jackie, do we have anything on that yet? Okay, that's the Davidsons, all right? And then with pushing, 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 I found out that Dave is po cooking for them, and Dave doesn't know how to cook anything, and so whatever. It's hard. Sometimes it's hard to let people do things for you. How many of you have that problem, all right? It's called pride. Okay, we'll work on that some other life. It is hard. It's hard. Some of you are, are really givers, uh, but you got to realize that sometimes God puts us in the place where we're forced to, we're forced to take, and that's hard. That's, that's a, even a greater less than sometimes than giving is, is being able to receive. Okay, so here's what I would like you to do. Mont uh, and Jackie, if you could go to Mont and Jackie tonight and be willing, let's get them about four or five meals. Uh, uh, Dave doesn't eat hardly anything these days, and so he'll just be pecking at it, but mostly for Marianne, but she can freeze whatever else, right, that she doesn't use, and she, they can eat it later. So let's get about five meals if we could, and... Um, Go to, to Mont and Jackie, and if you could, I would appreciate that. And I praise God for our deacons and their wives. This year, these last two years, have been a huge, a huge development in, um, in deaconing and serving. And I've been so excited about what I see. And Mont and Jackie and other deacons and their wives have worked so hard to minister to our people. And we have needs from time to time. You know, and you don't think about it until you're the one who has a need right? And you, praise God that we can serve each other. All right, I want you to say tonight as we begin before we pray, I am awake. I, am awake. I will learn. God's word, God's word is good. Father, I pray that we would be honest with what we just said. Praise you, praise you for all that you have done and given us your word. I ask, Lord, that some of these clarifications about the Holy Spirit biblically would cut through the jargon that's on our television from these television evangelists in the charismatic movement, I ask the Lord that it would be very clear to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to go to page 48, and that's where we're going to be speaking from or teaching from tonight. So I ask you to give plenty of interaction. Every verse that we go to, I, I would encourage you to turn in your Bible. We do have it up here for you if you would like to read it. But again, I never want to be accused of not opening God's Word. We will spend our time in the Word. Tonight we want to talk about this issue, the Spirit of God and our salvation. How does the Spirit of God, what does He have to do with our salvation? What is His job in our salvation? With, uh, with the charismatic mu movement and uh, the matter of being a Pentecostal and, and this matter of the community churches and the assemblies of God and, and, and the questioning about what the Holy Spirit is and, and the swing, the pendulum swing of fundamentalism, which for a long time just totally doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit at all and all the verses about the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do? Tonight we're not going to talk about all the work of the Holy Spirit. We're only going to talk about what He does the instant that you're saved. And that's the subtitle, Five Ministries of the Holy Spirit, The Instant We Believe. 
You're going to be amazed tonight that some of the, the things that you hear thrown around about that a Christian should be blanked by the Holy Spirit are words in the Bible that only speak of the moment that they're saved. And so we can't be something if we already have been something. We can't be baptized with the Holy Spirit if we have already been baptized. And if that word is only used as a singular event type word. If you need to stir yourself alive, hit the person next to you or whatever, and uh, we're going to get going tonight here. There are five things about our salvation that the Holy Spirit does. The first of all, the Holy Spirit births us. He births us. All right? There's a term that we use that you must be, yell it out. You must be born again. He births us. The, the Holy Spirit is very much if you, in comparison to a laborer and delivery doctor. All right? He is the one that uh, initiates what it means to be born again. Look at John 3 and verse 6 through 8. The Bible says, That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. You hear the wind, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. Think about the wind outside. You can see the trees move. You can see the leaves blow around. Not even the, um, uh, I'm thinking, think of fox weather or some of these weather, not even they can predict what's going to happen. Sometimes they do a good job, sometimes they do a terrible job. But who knows where the wind comes from, all right? Who knows where it's going to blow next? So is those who can tell who on a certain street, I live on Jamar Boulevard, of who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. There's only one person that can tell that, and that's the Holy Spirit. He's the one that moves men's hearts. I want you to notice the context of this. Does anybody know what the storyline is of, what, of when this was spoken in the Bible? Someone tell me. Yell out. John. Nicodemus. He was, who was Nicodemus? He was a religious leader. He was a religious leader that, that appears more than one time and, uh, in Scripture, and, and some in defense, defense of Christ. And he comes to Christ... And he, he acknowledges him as a, as a good man in these things. Jesus jumps to the point of this matter of him having to be born again. After this topic here, Jesus, or Nicodemus, is very confused what it means to be born again. We know what it means to be born again. We looked at the word regeneration, to be born again. The Holy Spirit has a part in this, and we see it here. Look at the first verse here. That which is born of flesh is flesh. Okay, that's physical birth. That is all you mommies and daddies out there that have been through the process. Those of you who rushed to the hospital and used it as a reason to speed and go through red lights so you can get your wife to the hospital in time. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit, and notice the capital S, it is the Holy Spirit. That which is born, the person born of the Holy Spirit is spiritual. He is a different person. Let's back up a bit. The Holy Spirit births us. It's the story of Nicodemus, and you must be born again. Spiritual birth. This is the specific work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit delivers you into a family you've never been into before. All right? Let me back up a little bit. We might wait a little bit for the Social Security card and for the birth certificate. But when we had our four children, there was no question of what family they came from. They didn't assign them to somebody else. We didn't have to prove it, whatever. Uh, it was very clear that they were Whitmers it, from the very beginning of, of delivery to the time that we went home and put them in the, in the, the carrier and put them and dropped. Those were Whitmer children. They, why? Someone tell me why. Because they were delivered into what? They were delivered into my family. Delivered by my wife. They were our children. And so is the Holy Spirit of God. When he starts convicting a man and showing them that man his, his sin... And he births him into the family of God. And that man believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit does this thing called borning again. I don't know all the spiritual ramifications of it. All right? But I know that it deals with the family. That we once were not in God's family. But now we are in God's family. What family were we in before? Satan. Satan's family. Take you to several passages that talk about our father, the devil. And that we were delivered from the, the, the family of darkness into the family of light, okay? So here you've got this work, the Holy Spirit. 
and he delivers you into the family. You know that song, I'm so glad I'm up? You know that song? Anybody? Know? How many of you know it? Raise your hand. All right, let's try it. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus. I'm a child of the whatever. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. My family used to sing that back in our home church. You are a part of the family of God because you've been birthed into it. Not because of some gifts or some, some certificate somewhere. You're, the Holy Spirit did something real. He birthed you into it. There was labor pains involved. Okay, there was real stuff going on here. Christ with the labor pains. You can take this to the furthest extent because God uses it. Okay, so that the Holy Spirit birthed you. Let me ask you, what does that do to your life? The Holy Spirit births you. What does that mean to you? Somebody tell me, what's that mean to you that you know that you were born by the Holy Spirit? You were birthed into the family of God. What's it mean to you? Okay, but the specific birth. Okay, you're on your way to heaven. What? I might be sinned with the will. Okay. Let's stay, though, very specific to this matter. What does it mean that you are birthed in the family of God? Yes. You have a father, a heavenly father there working with the terms. What else does it mean to you? Your joint heir, okay? Jesus is your spiritual brother. You, as he is exalted, you'll be exalted. What else? Okay, all right. Whitmers act like Whitmers for better or for worse. Okay? You're right. You are part of that family. Yes. All right, he comes in and lives with you. You are part of the family, but still stick with the family idea. The birthing, anything else? What's that? Yes, you start out as a new baby. You got to grow. All right. Need food to grow. Okay, all these things are great. How should this truth change your life? The fact that you are birthed into God's family. How should that truth change your life? Lauren said one of it. You, you're in a family. You act like you're in the family. I mean, you, you're part of that family. There are certain traits that you do in that family, certain traditions in that family. There are certain rules or certain whatever. Yes? Okay, you're, everything's come new. You're not part of the old family anymore. You're not part of that old family anymore. Yes? I agree. Exactly. You know why you go into some people's homes and you don't feel home at all, and other people's and you do, and you really feel at home in your own house? Because different families, like Dave, say, have different, I don't know if the word spirit or what, we won't use the same term to do two things, different attitudes, different emotions, different feelings, different way you do things, the same way with the Lord's family. All right, that's why, remember the words that we looked at on Sunday, behooved, and it's not convenient, you know, those words that we looked at out of Ephesians, it's not appropriate for a believer to act a certain way. That's, this is all what we're talking about. We're in a new family. You ever heard the, the term, um, the black sheep of the family? What is a black sheep of the family? They don't go along with the flow. They're, they're, they're kicking against what, you know, they're not like the family. All right, let's go on here. There's something, the second thing the Holy Spirit does is he seals us. Ephesians 4.30 says this, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let me just teach you real, one really quick thing, okay? When you see in your Bible, Holy Spirit, when you see the term in the New Testament, our spirit, Holy Spirit, it's the same word, okay? It, it, the spirit, the word spirit, is the same word, when you see the word Holy Ghost, it is the same word as the Spirit. I pr particularly the translation ghost is not, I don't like it very well, <laughs> okay? Because you get, what, what's that conjure up? How do you like that word, conjure? It's exactly what it does, it conjures up. Okay, it is the same word, the King James translators chose to use either Spirit or Ghost depending on what context they decided, but it's the same word, Spirit, okay, Spirit. So this verse says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let's look at it again. 
Grieve not the Spirit, of the, Holy, the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed in the day of redemption. It wasn't too long ago in Ephesians we preached on this chapter. Notice what it says. The Holy Spirit is the seal. Notice very closely something. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. It's not saying that the Holy Spirit sealed you, although he did. He actually is the seal. He's also something else yeah, along these lines. He is the earnest or the down payment of your salvation. He is the guarantee. He's all these things. He's the seal. Notice it says sealed. What is a seal? Somebody tell me in old terms, even new terms, what a seal is. How many truck drivers we got? Raise your hand. If you ever were a truck driver. How many women wish they were truck drivers? Okay. All right. Mr. Green, you were a truck driver some years. Did you ever have the back of your, your, your trailer sealed? Yes. Sir. What was that all about? That was about they were, people were stealing some of the goods out of the trailer. That's right. So there had to be a seal would put on until the next stop. And when you got to the stop, that seal was undone yep. by the owner or whoever received those, those goods. Yep. Same thing. That seal is the same. You, you can think about it, and I always think about it, the wax seal, because I like that signet ring kind of stuff. You know, that's a seal also on envelopes. Sometimes on special packages sent by kings and royalty. These are all the same idea. Uh, it shows, as you see the second bullet point up there, ownership. It shows possession. A seal shows possession. It's mine, not yours. It shows security. Mr. Green's case, it shows security. It's something that can't be broken. And what did the verse say? We're sealed until the what? Give me another word for that. What's the day of redemption? When are you going to be redeemed? When's your body going to be changed? Rapture. That's right. We're sealed to the day of redemption. We're sealed to the end, okay? So, sealed shows ownership, possession, security. It shows authority. When a king put a seal on something, it was so. It was the law of the Medes and the Persians. When Jesus, when God put his seal upon you, it showed that you were a child of the king. That you were royalty, that you were somebody, not through because of you, because of him. All right? We are sealed. The Holy Spirit seals us. He is the wax seal. He is the aluminum seal that's often used on the back of trucks and, and sealed, and it can't be clipped until it comes out, until, until it gets to its, its owner. And you can think of other seals that are used. There's seals used on computers now. There's all kinds of different things that, that seals that show ownership, possession, security, and authority. Sealed is eternal. You notice the verse. It says, until the day, and greet not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed in the day of redemption. It's something that shows forever. Notice one thing that I love about this verse. In the verse, when you grieve the Holy Spirit of God by sinning against Him or disappointing or whatever, does the seal of you being connected to God break? Yes or no? no? There's no possibility in the verse. The verse itself is telling you not to grieve, but the verse itself teaches another thing. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Don't disrupt Him. Don't make Him sorrowful. Don't bother Him. Don't sin against Him who lives inside of you. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed in the day of redemption. There's no chance of breaking the seal. It's a given in this verse. You know, sometimes we sin against him and we grieve him, but we can't break that seal. All right, it is a forever seal. So there's something else. That's the second thing. What does that mean to you that he seals you? And if we don't make it through this tonight, that's fine. We'll just come back and do it some other time. But what does it mean to you that you are sealed, that you are his possession, his authority is upon you, that he is your owner? What does that all mean to you? How, that you can grieve him, but it will not be broken. That seal, he sealed you and guaranteed you as a believer as his child forever. What's that mean to you? Yes. Keep me righteous until before God always. He will keep me righteous before God always. That's great. Yes. Eternal security. Eternal security. Okay, what else? I'm going to get there. All right, what else? What's that mean to you? That you are sealed in the day of redemption. How about this? That means to me that no matter what Satan does, he can't, he can't break that. He can't break my relationship to God. No matter how, how much I fail, I can't, I'm not going to break that seal. I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. He's stronger than me. All right? Something else that the Holy Spirit does. He baptizes you. This is one that is very controversial. It's 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13. How many of you have heard the idea that Christians 
should be baptized by the Holy Spirit some point after they are saved or the second work of grace or anything like that. Raise your hand if you heard of that, heard about that. Okay, that's an old idea that is not biblical. Look at what 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 through 13 says about this matter of being baptized. It says, For as, as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so is Christ. Let's stop there. There's many members to Christ. You are some of them here tonight. You're not all of them. All right? Not all of them are in Baptist churches, believe it or not. It reminds me of the joke about the angel when the Presbyterian came to heaven. He told him to be very quiet. He said, why? Because the Baptists are all in that other room. They think they're the only ones here. Okay? Baptists are not the only ones going to heaven, all right? Uh, those, that have, those who have placed their trust in Jesus Christ and been born again by the Holy Spirit, they are the ones. I believe the Baptists are the ones with the right methodology, but we'll talk about that later. There are many members of the body of Christ throughout all the ages, all right? Every age, you know, since the book of Acts, have had people who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? The body of Christ. Then notice the next verse. For by one Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, bond, you know, and free the idea of whether we're a slave or no matter what life situation, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. How many alls do you see up here tonight? How many alls are up there? All of them, Mr. Dr. Bish says. How many alls are up there, okay? For as one body, there are all. All. I've got three. Anybody got more? Okay. What does all mean? Does that, like, does that mean like some believers are baptized into the Spirit, by the Spirit, into the body of Christ, or that all believers are baptized? Okay. Let me just explain something very clearly, okay? Because some of you have not been not been saved a long, long time. The word "baptize" doesn't always refer to water, okay? It does mean. Let's back up here. It does mean the word means you see right in the middle "baptizo" to be fully immersed, right? It means uh, it comes from a term that they physically did, where they took a garment and they put it underneath a dye so that it would come out a different color, all right? I was with a couple of pastors and we were making fun of people that believe that John the Baptist and Jesus went down into the water with a cup and then he poured him over. You know, it's just it's illogical because the word itself means to immerse. All right? Immerse. That's a, even a proper translation. Immerse. Immerse. So you're, you, when you get saved, you're double baptized. All right? You get baptized a couple days later or a couple weeks later when the preacher can work it out with the, with the people who have the baptistry. But first of all, when you're saved, you're baptized, you're immersed into the body of Christ. And that's what this verse is. Where is it? Look at it and read it again. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all ba immersed, baptized, into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all made to drink into one spirit, one Holy Spirit. People say, oh man, I'm just praying I'll get baptized by the Holy Spirit. You just look them in the eye and you say, by the word of God I already have been. Amen. Thus saith the Lord, I've been baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. There's no, it's straight scripture. That term is thrown around so much on television and so much by the charismatic movement, but it's not biblical. All right, let's go on. What's that mean to you that you have been immersed into the body of Christ? You are part, Jack, of the body of Christ. That is the illusion he uses of a physical body, and you are part of that. I don't know which part. You are part of that, okay? What does that mean to you? That means that the Lord is in control of my life, and whatever he wants to do with it, he can do. Okay. Okay, all right. To Jack, that means that since I'm part of his body and I'm immersed into his body, he has the right to say whatever he wants of me. Okay, what does that mean to you? I have a function in the body. 
I have a function. There is a reason I'm alive. Okay. What else to say to you? Yeah. You need to be a working part of the body. Okay. Very good. Yes. No, I'm, I don't think so. Um, when, if you're talking about bap yeah, water right, baptism and, and, and you're coming out, that would represent the, the baptism. But this is the immersed part. I this know. is under the water okay, the part, but it's not talking about water. It's talking about you spiritually are immersed in the body of Christ. Okay, what does it mean to you? Yeah, you can't walk away from it. Are you partially a Christian? What about this idea? I'm, I'm a pretty good, you know, have you heard this, 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 this thinking? Like I'm a partial kind of thing. Like I'm, you know, I, I do Christian things, you know. It's, it's all or nothing. There is no middle ground here at all. You're immersed. You're all under the water of being a Christian. You're, you're totally dipped in there. Yes. That's a great point. You've got... All the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has all of you, all right? As far as practical working, He has all of your soul and all of your Christian, the part that you are a Christian. Practically, we ought to give Him all of who we are as far as activity and function and thought and all of those things. But that's, you're exactly right. I've got all the Holy Spirit that I'm going to get. All right? Other thoughts here. Okay, how should this truth change my life if I'm immersed in the Holy Spirit. If I'm immersed by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, how should that change my life? I gave you one. There's no part-time Christians, so don't act like it. It's an obligation. It's an obligation. It's a privilege and an obligation. What else? How else can it? Yes. You can share it with others. You can share it with others, okay. Is there a part of this that, that smacks to you also of eternal security? There is to me. I mean, I'm in this body of Christ. Who can sever that? Unless Christ would allow him. He, Christ's body was cut one time. He's not allowing anybody to sever it again. <laughs> okay? Yes? Do things that would please Christ. Do things that would please Christ because you're part of his body. That's good. Okay? Number four, the Holy Spirit indwells you. John 14, 16 says this. It says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. By the way, you're going to see italics and stuff up here. That's my computer. That was not, there's no, that doesn't mean anything by this. I don't know why it does that, but when I copy and paste it, sometimes the second verse gets put in italics. I don't know why. It says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. He dwelleth, here's our word, dwelleth, dwelleth with you. I will not lead you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Je this is all Jesus talking. Because I live, ye shall also. You shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Jesus is just about ready to be crucified. He's just about ready to leave this earth. And he tells him a comforter is coming, and that Holy Spirit uh, will dwell right there, dwelleth with you, and you shall be in you. All right? I was very surprised about something. Do you know that the term indwelled or indwelleth or indwells and Holy Spirit do not appear in any verse? This is the closest thing that we have with it, but we always use that term, not to say it's wrong, but I'm saying this is the closest thing we have to it in the Bible. But I want you to, just a little trivia there. The Holy Spirit indwells you. Uh, Romans 8 verse 9 says this, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, if so be that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, dwelleth in you. Now, there's our word dwell again. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. There is even doctrine about the Holy Spirit that teaches, goes so far as to teach that you don't get the Holy Spirit when you get saved. That You need to look for him in the future. You need to look for him and pray for a second work of grace on your life and to get the Holy Spirit. Not all Christians have the Holy Spirit, and you get him somewhere down the road. All right? What does this verse in Romans 8 and 9 so clearly say? Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Can you have Christ without the Holy Spirit, according to this verse? No. 
It's an impossibility. It's a physical, spiritual impossibility. You cannot be saved and not have the Holy Spirit in you. Amen. It's impossible. Okay? You, it, which is very obvious that He comes in you the moment you get saved. Every believer, ever, every believer instantly should be has the Spirit. Jesus promised the Spirit to abide with us forever. You see that in that verse. Forever He'll abide with you. See it up here? The Comforter, that He may abide with you forever, forever, the Holy Spirit. Will the Holy Spirit ever leave you? Yes or no? Yes. No. All right. Well, let's go into the last one. Number five. I guess we ought to ask this one real quick. What does that mean to you that the Holy Spirit indwells you? That when you get saved, He's inside of you forever. What does that mean to you? Brian, what does that mean to you? Okay, he sees everything you're doing. That sounds kind of negative. I'm kind of a positive person. Okay, he indwells you forever. What does it mean? Like, I like when verse 18 where it says he'll not leave you comfortless. <coughs> so, you know, that you won't be going through trials and stuff, that he's in you, dwelling with you, and you can be comforted by him. Okay, notice what it says. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. Verse number 18, I will not leave you comfortless. Does anybody remember Pastor Valiente and I have both preached on this in separate messages in the last past year? Does anybody remember what the word comfortless means? I will not leave you a what? An orphan. Okay? What Lauren says is exactly right. We always have a comforter within us. He'll never leave us. Do orphans sometimes feel like they're alone? Sure. Let me ask you, do... Do children who have been adopted sometimes still feel alone? Sure. Do my children start? Sure, they feel alone. But let me ask you, are they alone? No. That's the important part. Okay, facts of God's Word must supersede feeling. The truth is, we'll never be alone. We always have the comforter. All right, here we go. The last one is the Holy Spirit anoints you. Anoints you. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 and 27, this is the big, you hear uh, Rod Parsley and uh, <clears throat> these guys and Trinity Broadcast Network and this, all this, you know, this charismatic stuff talking about anointing, anointing, I'm anointing, you need to be anointing, I'm going to anoint this, I'm going to anoint this. Here's the passage, one of the main passages, and tell me something. <clears throat> tell me something about this passage. When does this take place? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20 through 27 I have gone from verse 20 to 27. The context is talking about false teachers. You don't see that here, but in your Bible, if you read through it, you will. It says, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. It's talking about there are some false teachers that will try to seduce you, but the Holy Spirit will lead you. You have an unction from Him. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye not, need not that any man teach you, talking about these false seducing spirit, uh, teachers, but as the same anointing teacheth you all things, and is truth, and is, no, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Listening to the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit as he teaches, and of course now we have the final written word of God. This written to people who did not have the complete word of God. This written in an apostolic age when the Holy Spirit was working in a very visible way. You'll notice two words here. You have an unction and an anointing. Guess what? They're the exact same word God uttered originally. Unction and anointing. Same word. Notice, please, that is the word charisma. Does that sound like anything to anybody? Charismatic. Charisma. This unction, this anointing. It deals with enabling or sending somebody or it's still you remember the old testament when they were going to be king they poured uh, they anointed their head with oil all right you remember this okay this is an anointing the, char the charisma deals with salvation not an experience or an extra gift look please at the phrase again but you have an unction from the holy one you have it and you know all things but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you and basically says that same anointing will guide you into the truth and you shall abide in him <clears throat> the, when we talk about anoint, being anointed by the Holy Spirit or having an unction from the Holy Spirit, folks, biblically, and looking through these passages today, studying, getting ready, they're talk, it's talking about salvation. Right? 
I am, I am sent of God. I'm anointed of God as his messenger, as his child, as one from God, all right, as the one that knows the truth. It's not talking about an unction to do a ministry. It's not talking about <coughs> a, an anointing to go be a preacher or something like that. It's talking about the Holy Spirit ha giving you an unction or an anointing at the point of salvation. Salvation. I would encourage you to look back, 1 John 2, 20 through 27, about unction and anointing. On page 48 of your book, I want to clear up something. Ketchum has a mistake. Okay? It is the book, your book, page 48, answer number five. I don't know, in your book on page 48, do you have the answers or just the questions? You have the answers also? All right. Ketchum answers the question of number five as if unction, charisma, unction, and anointing have to do with some gift that you're going to get. And it's not. It's a matter of salvation. All right? And I would highly encourage you that you would put to the side, according to this passage, this is salvation, not some gift I'm going to get. The Holy Spirit uh, unctions us or anoints us or however you want to say it at the point of salvation. 1 Corinthians 1.21 says this, Now he which established, establishes us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. The word us referring to both the people he's writing to and the Apostle Paul himself, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Last thing we're going to say, last time I'm going to make you use your brain, look at the verse up here in 2 Corinthians 1.21 or turn to it. What things is the Holy Spirit doing in 1 Corinthians 1.21? What is he doing? Okay, the first thing, he establisheth us. What's the next thing he does? Anoints us. What's the next thing he does? Seals us. What's the next thing he does? He is our earnest. Okay, it's a little bit different, but these words are all when? They're all salvation words. Okay, salvation words. When someone asks you if you're charismatic, you say, absolutely. I was anointed of God by the Holy Spirit the day I was saved. Say I was saved. I was anointed as a child of God. I was anointed as a prince or a princess of the king of kings. All right? Don't be fooled by the winds that blow. These words, as I've showed you from Scripture, and I encourage you to go home and study them, are things that have happened to us at salvation by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Don't look for more of the Holy Spirit. He has all of you, and you have access to all of Him. Don't look for another experience. You do not need it, and it has nothing to do with your closeness to the Lord. Enjoy and thrive in the joy of the Lord. Okay? Most of the time when believers are looking for something else, they're not utilizing what they already have. Let me say that again. Most of the time when believers are looking for something else, they are looking for a quick fix of a good feeling. They're not looking for the endurance of serving God, the discipline of prayer, the endurance of being righteous and holy and walking the way God wanted us to walk. They're looking for something they can feel, being a banga. They're looking for an emotionalism that the scripture does not encourage or teach about the Holy Spirit. Someday we can go through the Acts passages, but I can take you through them and explain some of the things that are going on there too. But this should be five things the Holy Spirit does, ministers to us in our salvation. Let's have a word of prayer.